let's talk electromagnetic compliance since we were showing off that power supply and the noise it gives off and there's always noise around you in an environment i'm scared to measure with all the strange lights and leds and screens and stuff that i've got going on here um tell us about the importance of being compliant because i as a hobbyist it's not the first thing on my mind i design a circuit does it work yes great into the into the field and by the field i mean my local environment but when you've got to start selling and mass production uh, how do you go about that even as a hobbyist you should be compliant because there is rules for that but as you said it's usually the last thing we all have on our minds and the problem is we usually can't see it and can rarely see the effects of it in essence, there's uh, two primary kinds of emissions. One is radiated emissions and the other one is conducted. Uh, what uh, Thomas just talked about is mostly going to be radiated and yeah. you don't see it, you don't hear it. Well, unless you have something next to it that's susceptible to it. And the last thing is that we certainly do never think about as hobbyists, I think I can claim, is uh, radiation immunity. That is one thing we never think about that our device also has to function if an unintended or intended radiator uh, starts interfering with it. Uh, some things we all know is your old mobile phone next to the FM radio in the car. We all knew the call was incoming before the phone started ringing. This is a type of... Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, that is one of those. And we still have AM radio stations around, albeit not very many here in Europe. And those are all things that we need to take into consideration. The problem is that there's so many rules and regulations that uh, hobbyists get turned away from it very quickly because you always have to see, okay, what is the exact norm and rule that you need to look at? But to be pragmatic about it, um, the first thing is look at it at all, like start doing something, take uh, test equipment. And for instance, here we have, well, maybe I should start with the screen. No, I won't. This is a line impedance stabilization network. This is one that's primarily for CISPR 25 applications, which usually goes to uh, vehicles and stuff like that. When we build stuff at home, the CISPR 11 rules would be more applicable as they are more for industrial and scientific equipment. Regardless how this works, you have your power source gets applied here. You have your device under test, which in EMC is also often called the equipment under test or EUT. And it, well, I wouldn't say isolates, but it filters RF coming from this side and from this side completely between those ports. So also your power supply will not interfere with your device under test. And then you've got this coupled port there you can hook up your measurement receiver a spectrum analyzer or as we'll see in a second even a simple oscilloscope just to get a overview of what's actually happening just get a starting point now if you show my shared screen i will show what a listen generally looks like let's take that one this is just from wikipedia sources down there this is nothing but a simple uh, pi low pass filter and you can see a symmetric, it's a, it's a reciprocal network, which is very important. And this goes to your EMI receiver and here to the DUT. Now the one I'm using and which is very feasible for hobbyists is uh, made by TechBox, it's called TBOH01. It's a little bit more complicated, but only because it has protection elements in here for over voltage, even a gas discharge tube and stuff like that. And the most basic thing you can do, I will show in just a second, measuring power supply noise. Let me actually switch cameras. Let's see what you have on there. You have the screen, fine. Let's swap over to Sigland. Cool. I hope nobody's dizzy now. Not from this. Good. Can you see that all right? Yes. So yeah. what we're looking at here is the listen. On this side, I have a 100 ohm resistor. Over here, I have a five volt, no, it's a USB extension cord for five volts that I will plug into one of those uh, power supplies in a second. Can we see that? Yes, down there. And we will see what shows up on the scope. The scope, let's see, yes, you have the screen shared. So let me do this full screen. Yeah, perfect. 
So up here is uh, channel one. This is connected directly to the listen. Down here, there's a math function performing an FFT. Levels is an a DBV. Usually for electromagnetic uh, compliance, you use DB microvolts, but you can just add 120 and you're good. And we will see a peak list. Now let me plug in the USB power supply and see what happens. So up there, we already see that there's quite a bit of noise. I'm zoomed out quite a bit right now, but just to get enough FFT bins filled to get quite an interesting picture. This is uh, four averages, as it says there, so it'll take a second till the peak stabilized. And we can see that there's two large peaks, one around 9 kilohertz, one around 22 kilohertz. So this will be the first step of what we could do at home and how we could see what's going on with our equipment. Now, the next question that's, of course, interesting, would this be compliant? Is that OK? So if we add about 120 decibels to these values, we're somewhere between 40 and 42 uh, dB microvolt, which would actually be within all limits prescribed. Now, one thing, and that goes back to Alfred's problem, if you look in the rules and norms, there's very specific test setups um, that you need to use. Like obviously just putting down a listen like this would not be okay. You would need a grounded base plate. The uh, length of the wires is all in the standards and norms. So what might happen is that you actually seem to be compliant, but the way the user will actually use your product in the end will start all kinds of interference which is something you should keep in mind. You, you don't legally have to keep it in mind, but you should. Well, that would be the first thing of testing radiated emissions. Now, a listen can be used as kind of an off-label use for all kinds of other setups, for instance, for conducted immunity testing. As you can imagine, if instead of the oscilloscope, we would connect a um, signal generator and inject a signal, we could also see how the power supply reacts to um, interference from outside conducted interference. Typically, you would use a so-called CDN, a coupling-decoupling network. But for at-home amateur-level experiments, this is absolutely sufficient to simply misuse a listen for that purpose. Yeah, that, that looks like quite a bit of noise. And I see it says triggered at the top there. You've you've just triggered me because I remembered <laughs> times when I just couldn't get an HDMI signal HDMI signal to work. I just couldn't. I tried different cables, and then eventually I moved the cable away from the power cable, and suddenly the signal worked. Absolutely, and the reason I didn't just set this up for this electro live stream. Now, of course, I rebuilt the experiment because of that. But what actually happened is. I had a uh, audio amplifier that worked very well into the ultrasonic range. It's uh, for a different project where I'm using an SDR receiver to receive ultrasound signals, acoustic ultrasound signals. And I was actually charging my phone next to the setup on the bench. And uh, the output of the uh, audio amplifier was yeah, basically representing that plus 100 decibels. So it was extremely wow. noisy. I just couldn't. I couldn't see what is going on. It, like there was obviously no useful audio signal coming through. And then I unplugged my phone, went outside just to clear my mind of what's going on, you know, just reset and surprise, surprise, uh, the noise was gone. Well, yeah, came as a surprise to me too, especially with, you know, digital, you can't see the noise. Back in the analog TV days, you would see when you got closer to the the noise source, but now it just stops working or it works intermittently. What would be a good way to measure that kind of noise in your environment? An SDR with some sort of antenna? Yes, SDRs are actually um, very good for that. Let me see. I have some pictures from university. Let me see what I can actually show. Let me get the screen sharing smaller. Though. So, well, this is going to look a little bit funny, but sure, let's show it because someone that definitely wasn't me. OK, well, I'll admit it. Put a chicken inside of the measurement antenna. Uh, I'm not sure if you chicken. can. Yeah, 
that that uh, it's like a dog toy that squeaks and is one way to drive professors nuts when you're bored in class. This is a biconical antenna, and here's a logarithmic periodic antenna. You do not need anything like that I, at all. This, I'm not sure we're seeing the correct uh, tab there. Oh, you're right. Still looking your zig, Apparently, your I have. Output. Yes, you're right because I don't have the screen shared. I have that particular tab shared. So give me one second. Present and share screen. Whole screen. That screen. Now let's try again. Where did the picture go? It's gone. Let's take that. Can you see that now? I think you got it. Yep. Yep. Okay. So a here's a biconic. Chicken. I thought you meant to. Yeah. I thought you were microwaving an actual chicken. No, 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 no. And we had to actually justify in the lab report how that didn't interfere with the measurement. But this is just an example of a professional setup. This is a biconical antenna. And here's a logarithmic periodic antenna. And this entire thing is inside an anechoic chamber. Now, obviously, that's nothing for the hobbyist. A simple loop antenna is sufficient. And I'm only mentioning this because it's our sponsor. Yes, you could use, of course, a, um, what's it called? A um, software-defined receiver, of course. Uh, but the Siglin spectrum analyzers are actually, hang on, let me bring up this picture. I'll explain in a second what this is. Not only do they have an EMI option, and there's a free trial if you want to try it out, um, but they actually work with most accepted um, EMC compliant softwares like EMC View, ReadyMation, and stuff like that. So if you have one of these, and they're certainly affordable for hobbyists, then uh, you're all set. A software-defined receiver, of course, works as well. On a side note, since I do have it open, what this thing here in the middle is, is called a uh, TEM cell, a transversal electromagnetic wave cell. It's basically a coax cable with the inner conductor, the outer conductor, but split open in a way that you can put devices under test right in there. By the way, it should be down there, but who's paying attention in class, right? It's terminated with a 50 ohm load here, and this goes directly to your measurement receiver. Now, these are quite expensive, but as you can imagine, if you're handy, you can build these on your own. It's just a little bit of folded sheet metal. In the middle, you can use standard FR4 material, and you can build yourself one of those. You just toss the equipment in, hook it up to your measurement receiver, and you get an overview of the radiated emissions. Let me the shape of the, the chamber? Yeah, it's basically... Here it's a coax with 50 ohms, and this is just spreading it open. And here we still have, well, technically we have a free wave impedance in here of 377 ohms, but um, this is the wave impedance down here. What it really does is it takes the free room uh, impedance of air and space and just trans, uh, trans what's it called, uh, translates it down back to 50 ohms. It's symmetrical on both sides. You can also use it for injection. Again, you could also apply a signal generator to the side and see how much RF blast your DUT can handle. This is something that's easily achievable at home. Then another thing I wanted to show from that particular lab. I have one question to this yeah. thing. Uh, are the dimensions available as a PDF or so? Would be interesting. Yes. Absolutely. You can find them for free on the internet. There actually is a bunch of people that build their own because they're such useful tools. Uh, I do not have a link handy, but if you Google it, you will find something like that. There's a few people that build them on their own. Uh, um, what name or what, uh, what word to Google? TEM cell. I'll actually type that in the chat like so for everyone to see. There we go. Now it should be in the chat. There we go. Okay. And then there's two more things I wanted to show because now we've shown some interference, but what we haven't shown is what we can do on an amateur level. I'll, I don't want to hog all the time, so I'll be done in a second. Here is a albeit not uh, norm and standard compliant test me measurement setup. Here is a um, higher voltage listen. There is a DC DC converter. Here is a variable load. And if I zoom in, that's the nice thing about the Cycland SVA with the EMI option. 
as you can see here, there's limit lines in there and it'll give you markers. They are not standard peak markers. They'll tell you where you're non-compliant. So you can identify frequencies. And in this case, it's around 330 megahertz to about, it's around about one megahertz is where the peak is. So once you've identified that, that's only half of uh, what you need to know. You kind of need to do anything against it. Not anything, something against it. Where is that picture? And with that, I'm going to mention Wirt Electronic. They have these kits. They are, there we go. Then we have a picture. Yeah, that's the one that we built. So what you get in this kit is the space PCB. There's a few different variants and you get a few standard components. But what you also get with it is a booklet that shows you standard frequency responses of different filter variants. Um, so you can really just, even if you don't know anything about it, you can see where do I exceed my limits and then look in the given frequency responses, assemble the filter board, which obviously is uh, intended for um, main supply, but you can use it for DC as well, which we did and just assemble it, hook it in between your DUT and your power supply or the source of radiation. And then if we measure again with the filter in line, once I find it, my folders always disappear. This will, yeah, there we go. Come on, do it. This is, of course, we move things around a little bit, but as you remember beforehand, all the peaks that were exceeding the limits, now all we did is uh, put this uh, Word Design Your EMC filter in line. And you can see, even though it's not very sharp, there is not a single peak exceeding the limits. Now, to be fair, you would still do some additional attenuation here because you're way too close to the limit lines. Now, I should mention that this is not compliant with norms the way we did it there, but yeah, this is EMC 101. Just identify your problem and do something against it and know your limits. Cool. Well, that's 101. I think you could do a whole course. We could do 102, 103, not now, of course, but uh, it is certainly something to think about, not just for hobbyists, but when you start thinking about putting your stuff out there and it needs to be compliant.